Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's online conversation, Achieving Net Zero, How a Climate Accountability Law Will Get Us There. My name is Carolyn, and I'm helping to run this session today. And I work with EcoJustice's communications team and am and joining the call today from Vancouver. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And as someone, as a person of Chinese and European ancestry, I'm a settler here on these lands. And, uh, and I'm someone who's committed to the work of reconciliation. And I was thinking today about what that means for me. And I'm someone who loves podcasts. And so I'm really uh, taking time and making sure that I'm seeking out uh, hearing from listening to and learning from Indigenous people and Indigenous voices. So as people continue to log on, uh, let's take a moment and just make sure everyone's comfortable using this online platform. I am imagining, and just so you know, I can't see anybody out there, but I'm imagining that there are a number of people who are logging on today who've joined our previous conversations, but that there are possibly, uh, quite possibly, some people who haven't uh, joined one of these yet. And so I want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and familiar with uh, the GoToWebinar platform. So on the right of your screen, you'll see an image of the control panel. And I would like to point out some important features, starting with the grab tab, which is the arrow um, inside an orange rectangle at the top left of your control panel. And when you click on this, you will minimize or expand the panel. And then uh, moving to your audio options, which you should be able to see with your panel expanded. Uh, you've got either the option of computer audio or phone call. Um, if you click on the circle beside your preferred audio option, you're gonna switch between the two. Um, if you were wanting to use your phone, this is where you can find instructions for calling in. And then finally, the question box. So the question box, uh, this is where you can submit your comments and your questions to our panelists at any point during today's conversation. We have set aside time at the end to take your questions, but please you know, feel free to submit them as they come up at any point during today's discussion. And just so you know, um, that uh, what you type cannot be seen by other attendees. So the question box isn't really, it doesn't function as a chat. Um, I will be forwarding your questions to our panelists. So why don't you go ahead and test this feature? Um, I'd love to hear where folks are joining from today. So if you uh, would like to drop that into the question box, uh, please go ahead. And I'm just taking a look here. I see we've got lots of people calling in from Ontario and Toronto, Ottawa area, Edmonton, Victoria, Seashell, British Columbia, up on the coast here, uh, Vancouver Island, Horseshoe Bay, Montreal, welcome Montreal, uh, Port Perry, Ontario. Oh, someone from Whitehorse. Uh, thanks for joining us all the way from Whitehorse. Great, and as people continue to join us, I'd like to just also take a moment to tell you a little bit about EcoJustice. So our mission is to go to court and to use the power of the law to defend nature, combat the climate crisis, and fight for a healthy environment for all. Our strategic uh, public interest litigation and our advocacy work uh, go hand in hand. And what I mean by that is uh, when governments and polluters, corporate polluters break laws that are put in place to protect our health, uh, to protect our communities and our environment, eco-justice takes them to court, holds them to account. And and when our laws are not up to the task of defending nature, fighting the climate emergency, or if they're not sufficiently protecting the people and the places that we love, eco-justice advocates for stronger, more effective laws. And that leads us really to today's conversation on climate accountability. And at this point, I would like to introduce you to our guest moderator, Dr. Ann Keery. And Anne is a scholar. Hi, Anne. Thank you for joining us. Anne is a scholar, a parent, and a climate activist. 
As a historian of settler colonialism and studies the historical roots of our contemporary crises. And she organizes with two grassroots groups, Climate Fast and For Our Kids. Um, she does this work to demand climate justice and a livable future for all. And I'd like to invite Julia, my colleague Julia, to join us. Uh, Julia started working with EcoJustice back in 2016, and we are incredibly lucky uh, to have such an experienced and talented litigator as Julia on our team. Um, she's also the lead author of a 2020 report on climate accountability law, and she is a wealth of knowledge on today's topic of discussion. And then last but not least, I'd like to introduce and welcome Tony Mass, EcoJustice's Director of Legislative Affairs. So Tony's role at EcoJustice is really to um, focus on our efforts to reform and modernize environmental laws and policies in Canada. Uh, his experience of providing strategic advice on environmental issues to policymakers and nonprofit organizations um, uh, sorry, he, he brings uh, many years of experience doing this, and he's someone who really knows the ins and outs of our federal political system. And what I really appreciate about, appreciate about Tony is that he's always uh, very enthusiastic and generous about sharing his knowledge. So welcome to all of you. I know everyone's uh, keen to jump into this conversation, so I'm going to hand things over to you at this point, and I'll be joining you all a little bit later on. Thank you very much for those um, introductions, Carolyn, and thank you for all the amazing work that EcoJustice is doing. I'm really pleased to be here today with um, Julia and Tony. Uh, Julia and I are joining you from Toronto, which is on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And I'd like to say here that one of the things I'm really thankful for is that the uh, climate, accountability, climate accountability legislative framework um, that is being proposed here does put such an emphasis on recognizing Indigenous rights and including Indigenous voices and insists on the full implementation of UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is a reminder to us all to stand up against colonial violence and stand up for Indigenous rights to life, livelihood, and most importantly, land. Tony, would you like to uh, tell us where you're coming from today? Yes, thanks, Anne. I'm, uh, I'm a little down the road. I'm joining you from my home in uh, Kitchener, downtown Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, so that means that I am on a tract of land that's known as the Haldeman Tract, which is an area of land that is uh, six miles wide on each side of the Grand River that was promised to the Haudenosaunee uh, of the Six Nations of the Grand River. Um, and this land is the traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and neutral people. Thank you, Tony. Well, let's get into our conversation, and um, I'd like to start with a question to Julia. Julia, can you tell us why do we need a climate accountability law? Uh, well, simply as probably the majority of the people listening in would know and agree, the climate emergency is is not going anywhere. It's, um, if anything, uh, the last year has shown us that. Um, we need more decisive action and we need it sooner than later. Uh, and the more action and the sooner we get that action, the better our chances are of avoiding the disastrous impacts of climate change. Uh, Canada has missed every emissions target it set since Rio in 1992. Uh, and what that shows, which, you know, not terribly surprising, political promises are easily broken and targets are too easily missed but a law can solidify those commitments and turn targets and commitments into real climate action. And so that in a nutshell is why we need one. Thank you. And right now, of course, um, the top priority in the federal government is COVID-19. So can you explain why this legislation should also be a priority for this government? I'd make two points. In, in response to that question. Um, first, 
what we know the data is showing more so every day as it um, uh, you know, as this wears on is that the those worst impacted by COVID-19 are racialized and low-income communities who are the same communities that are facing the greatest risk from climate change. And it's become increasingly apparent that it's not just case-by-case uh, -case, you know, responses to these problems that we need, it's systemic change in order to protect um, those communities and change the historical path that we've been on. A climate accountability law is one one such systemic change. It can um, dovetail with the systemic change that's required to address COVID-19. Um, we also have seen in the federal government's response to the COVID-19 crisis, um, its its ability to take decisive action was really rooted in its, our strong public healthcare system in many respects. Um, and that healthcare system has its roots in federal legislation dating back to the 1960s. You know, I'm a former historian. I, I take these lessons very seriously that, that we want to be able to successfully tackle climate threats in the years to come. What we know is we need strong systems, strong laws in place to help us do that. And again, so that's, I would say, another strong argument for why uh, the lessons, I think, of COVID drive home the point that we can't wait to address climate change. Absolutely. Um, certainly, if we haven't learned the lesson that now is the time to listen to the scientists and look after people, surely we are learning this lesson now. And of course, the inequities that have been revealed by the COVID-19 crisis also play out on around the world. So Tony, a question for you. Um, how does a climate accountability law help Canada in the global fight against climate change and move Canada to play its part in tackling the climate crisis? Right, thanks, Anne. Um, well, I mean, uh, if we were in um, before times or normal times, pre-COVID times, um, right now, um, uh, political leaders from around the world would be gathering or preparing to gather uh, for the um, for COP 25, 25 or 26, um, 25. Yeah, um, and of course they're not because of COVID. Uh, but that need not delay or put off the type of uh, of work that uh, we're doing around climate accountability and the need for type, this type of legislation in Canada. In fact, um, you know, if we were in, uh, you know, pre-COVID times, our hope would have been that our government would be standing up shoulder to shoulder with other governments around the world who have passed strong climate accountability legislation. Um, so we've had a bit of a pause, but um, that impetus to join global leaders, the UK, New Zealand, and others who have put these types of accountability mechanisms in place, the pressure uh, needs to stay on and the hope that Canada will indeed move in that direction uh, remains. And of course, I think um, it's important to, to note now that we're seeing some settling, I think, and some certainty around the results of the, the US election, um, that uh, the kind of vision and, and commitments that uh, President-elect Joe Biden has put forward um, really similarly reflect the type of things that need to happen in Canada and as our significant uh, partner in North America, uh, the US begins to transition power and begins implementing uh, and moving towards, again, more aggressive action on climate change, we need to be shoulder to shoulder with them. Absolutely. Um, and it's certainly, it's a very encouraging sign um, that from the US um, and I very much hope that they will now move boldly on climate change. Let's get into the nuts and bolts of this um, legislative framework. So this is a question for Julia. How will a climate accountability law help us tackle the climate crisis? Great, yeah, I love nuts and bolts. Um, so I'm gonna ask for my first slide from the magicians behind the curtain. There we go. Thank you. Uh, so uh, 
the uh, um, in the introduction, Carolyn mentioned the uh, I was the lead author in a report. We we wrote that report with Canrac, uh, West Coast Environmental Law, Equiterre, Environmental Defense, and the Pembina Institute. Um, all 45 plus pages of it. If you feel like reading the big one, or there's a 10 pager, which is actually I think a 20 pager. Uh, Tony will laugh. He tells me to write a 10 pager and I give him 20. Um, so uh, and the, this is a sort of quick overview of the work that went into that. Um, so we studied international examples. Um, we looked at the Canadian context. We talked to experts in Canada. And what we distilled um, were five pillars that should be represented in a uh, robust Canadian climate accountability law or framework. And these are the five here quickly. Pillars one through three are really our goal setting pillars. So what do we need to do? Pillar four is a, an iterative process for planning, acting, reporting, and then uh, adapting to address shortfalls. Pillar five is the system of independent expert oversight. So as Anne said, what we hope we've learned over the last little while is let's listen to the scientists. Um, you know, they're not perfect, but that way lies far more, uh, far better outcomes than not. And um, so the fifth pillar is that key arm's length expert committee, which would have its fingers into everything else that happens under an accountability framework. Can I get the next slide? Target setting provisions are, are the most straightforward. They're really the, the, the lodestar of climate accountability legislation. What are our goals targets? But what would be a little bit different about having it in legislation versus just commitments made on the international stage as we've done uh, Rio and Kyoto and Copenhagen, all of which we missed, was that the legislation would say, would be binding on the government, ideally, using language like it is the duty of the ministers to ensure that the net carbon account for Canada in the year 2050 is no greater than net zero. Uh, this strong language, again, legislation while better than a political promise could theoretically be repealed but it is uh, a significant step stronger uh, than than just a, a political promise can i get the next slide you've got to carve up that long-term target though um uh carbon budgets which is the approach that's been taken across many other jurisdictions like household budgets, break down how much GHG Canada can spend on our path to net zero. These are as important, if not more so, than, this, than the 2050 target. Um, Greta Thunberg, a couple of days ago, spoke out about the fact that these long-term net zero targets are just far too nebulous. Um, those goals are not in and of themselves sufficient. We need to start parsing out what they mean in the near, much nearer term. And carbon budgets are a key way to do that. The legislation we propose wouldn't set the carbon budgets themselves. Instead, it would set timelines or process. So it would read, for example, the responsible minister shall set the carbon budget for the period X by this date, and so on. Rolling deadlines so that you are setting carbon budgets starting, let's say, in a couple of years, taking you all the way to 2050, pushing that downward path of emissions the whole way. Can I get the next slide? Five-year impact reports. Adaptation is a huge part of what we need to be thinking about, of course, in our response to climate change. And in order to adapt, you need to know what are the impacts that are coming your way. So this, um, our recommendation is that the legislation would require the government to, every five years, put out a report saying what are the impacts of climate change, uh, risks to Canada that are coming down the pipe. Ideally, these would precede the next carbon budget by a couple of years. So when you're setting that next carbon budget, you've just seen what's coming down the pipe. And it makes the, uh, the emissions reductions that we're proposing in the carbon budgets, you know, kind of hang together a little bit better people are like oh you want us to do what you want us to reduce our emissions by how much here's why 
Next slide, thank you. So pillar four, this iterative system of planning, acting, and reporting that I mentioned. Again, it's really the legislation would be setting out timelines. The government must meet a deadline for tabling a plan to meet a given carbon budget. They table that plan before Parliament. It's scrutinized. There'd be a role for the expert committee to also scrutinize and report on that plan, say, is it adequate? Is it going to is it going to do what needs to be done? You would similarly, again, in ideal legislation, have to table a plan on how we will adapt to the impacts of climate change. So this would be an adaptation plan. And the uh, legislation would set out a framework for delivering these plans, tying them to the specific impact reports and carbon budgets. The expert committee over and above, so I can go back one slide on this, would, would be regularly reporting on progress. And so their reports on progress would be tabled and made public through an ideally uh, tabled before parliament and a subject of debate in the house. So you could see where gaps are starting to show, and that would be a feedback for government, how they need to adjust. And lastly, that last slide, uh, pillar five, the expert committee, giving you a flavor of their role throughout, but this would be a committee made up of independent experts on climate change, clean tech, economics, and so on, representing regional and indigenous perspectives. They'd be providing advice, so on the targets, for example, on the carbon budgets, on the impact reports. They'd also provide advice on the plans, so how to meet the carbon budgets, how to address the impacts. And then on top of providing advice, it must independent of government monitor and report. So that is that arm's length. We've got the government doing its own reporting, but you've also got these external experts saying, well, this is how we see it. We've got that check and balance. Can I get the last slide? Together, these are a comprehensive package in our view. It's not a suite of options. If they're implemented together, those five pillars can hold up and create a very strong framework that can get the job done. They can transform how we approach climate action, redefine our ambition and set us on course to, to a low carbon future. You start taking away elements, it's not gonna work as well. You take away too much, um, there's there's an open question whether it does anything at all. So that's that's essentially the, uh, the thrust of what we're recommending. Thanks, Julia. Um, you mentioned that this legislation is modeled on um, legislation that has been adopted in other countries. Um, so can you explain a little, how has this worked in other countries? Sure, I've got another slide. <laughs> if, um, pop that up. Yeah, so, I mean, lots of factors at play here, but it's pretty illustrative uh, that the UK um, introduced its Climate Change Act in 2008, just over a decade ago. And you can see here from this chart, it was already on a downward, a bit more of a downward trajectory, whereas Canada's emissions were climbing. Canada's this darker blue line here. But uh, where is the UK's Climate Change Act comes into force in this dotted red line, we see a very clear continual push down of GHG emissions through to the most recent reporting years, 2017, 2018. So that, you know, sort of qualitative evidence, um, as well as some very robust academic study of the effect of that legislation, uh, reaching out to um, stakeholders across industries, politicians, bureaucrats, policy uh, analysts, and so on, that that framework has had a direct hand in the UK's success thus far. The UK has met its first three carbon budgets, oh, sorry, has met its first two carbon budgets, is on track to meet its third. It, there is a gap showing to its fourth and fifth, but what is so valuable about their framework is that that gap has been shown many, many years in advance. So we can start to adapt the policies they've got on staff to address that shortfall. So 
you know, that's the UK example, um, which is really the one we have the most data for because it's been in place for 10, 12 years. But what we know is that other countries, many other countries reached the same conclusion and are passing similar laws. Thank you, Julia. So we need to get this through our parliament here in Canada. So my next question is going to be for Tony. Um, Tony, what has been the reaction of politicians and vested interests that you have met with um, on the Climate Accountability Act? Yeah, good question. And, and uh, that's the important piece of the puzzle that we're kind of in the midst of right now, right? How do we how do we get legislation before the House of Commons, before Parliament, and not just before it, but through it? Um, I'm going to go backwards a little bit and just note that uh, we at EcoJustice and, and all of the partners that Julia listed uh, when she was listing off our partners um, from the report that we put together have really been advocating for a few years now for something akin to the UK Climate Act in Canada. And um, that includes uh, just prior to the 2019 election where our efforts really focused on uh, pushing all parties to, to make commitments to something like the UK Climate Act in their election platforms. And uh, those conversations were really important because that's what sets the stage for eventual introduction of legislation, uh, which, we're, which we're aiming towards now. And the good news is uh, that, um, that through that process, the Liberals, the NDP and the Greens, uh, as well as the Bloc, I believe, all made pretty strong commitments to uh, climate accountability or, or something uh, about much more robust, stronger action on climate change. So there's uh, a majority of parties and majority of uh, members in the House of Commons now uh, have a clear kind of perspective that uh, increased climate ambition and legislation to ensure uh, accountability is, is an important piece of the puzzle. Um, I think also just broadly politically, it's important to, to recognize, and I think we saw this in the 2019 election, that um, that the idea that you can simply uh, uh, set targets, make commitments on the global stage, uh, kind of come home to Canada and either ignore or or miss them uh, on an ongoing basis is no longer politically feasible. Uh, climate change and the environment more broadly factored into the 2019 election, and that bodes well for where we're at now, which is um, which is bringing legislation before the House. Um, so more recently, what we've been doing is taking the work that Julia presented uh, and bringing that to um, the minister's office, to the minister's advisors, and talking through with them what we believe would be in a strong and robust Climate Accountability Act. The reception has been great. Uh, as these things go, we never know uh, about the, the devil that is in the details till we see those details. Um, He's good on his word. The Minister of Environment and Climate Change, uh, the Honourable Jonathan, Jonathan Wilkinson, has committed to introducing a new climate plan by the end of 2030, uh, which we hope will uh, incorporate or a part of that will be introduction of legislation on climate accountability. Um, the other piece uh, of your question, Anne, about vested interests is an important one as well, because, uh, you know, government, um, wants to hear from a range of interests and a range of perspectives when they're making significant changes like uh, is proposed in the legislation that we're talking about. And we've also had conversations with uh, progressive uh, industry groups, for example, uh, in the water power sector, uh, the insurance sector, who all see benefit in this uh, longer term view, but broken down as Julia talked about with the UK Act into these five year cycles. and. The appeal to them, in addition to genuinely being concerned about climate and, and as it impacts uh, them and their children, is from a business perspective, it provides them much more certainty in terms of planning out what are sometimes decade-long projects, if you think about constructing uh, some of the infrastructure we're talking about uh, or, or plans to adapt to climate change. It really kind of is material to their business and having that clarity and certainty in legislation provides a, a strong basis for support for this type of legislation. Great, thanks, Jane. I think you meant um, that Jonathan Wilkinson wanted to get the legislation through by 2020. 
uh, by the end of 2020, you said 2030. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting all my dates mixed up today. That's right. The, the intent was to have a new climate plan tabled by the end of 2020. That's right. And whether or not this legislation will be part of it uh, is, a, is a question we hope to see answered soon. Um, just to put that in perspective, it will take uh, a bit longer than the end of 2020 to get that through the, the parliamentary processes, but uh, we can talk more about that further along in the webinar if you want. Thanks for that correction, Anne. No worries. Um, well, now is the time then for everyday Canadians to start um, pushing their MPs on this. So can you give us some advice on how we can um, contact our MPs and talk to them and encourage them to um, adopt this law? Absolutely. Yeah, um, and, and uh, I think we've got a slide that we're gonna pull up here in a second that, that sketches out a bit of this. Um, I'll start just by saying that in the good old days, I would say the absolute best um, approach would be to arrange a meeting or go and knock on the door uh, of the constituency office of your local member of parliament. Um, but of course, uh, you know, things, things are not uh, conducive to that right now under the, uh, under the pandemic. So um, rest assured there are other ways, uh, a number of other ways that you can, you can bring attention to this important issue and, and show your support for this legislation uh, to your elected officials. So um, in lieu of being able to walk up to their door, uh, you can always send an email, uh, or I would think more effectively uh, call your, your MP's constituency office. Um, putting in a phone call uh, is a little bit more challenging for them to overlook than, than an email, and they receive tons of email on, on any given day. So um, as you're reaching out to your members of parliament, um, one of the, the things you can do is share your personal concerns or your lived experience around climate change kind of makes it real for them and puts it in the context of their representing you uh, in the House of Commons. Um, if you do offer the phone call option and you get a voicemail, leave a voicemail because they listen to those. Um, it's probably better than, than waiting till you get a live person on the line. Uh, they're always also receiving plenty of phone calls. So, so go ahead and leave a voicemail and, and ask uh, when you do for them to return your call and follow up with you because that provides the opportunity and puts the ball in their court to uh, to engage in a, in a deeper conversation with you about this. Uh, think about who your elected officials are, um, why climate matters to them, but also uh, tailoring your message to where we're, where they, they lie on the political landscape. So for the uh, Liberal MPs, and, and I'll just say that this is, is um, it's important all the time, but it's particularly important now because we're in a minority parliament where opposition parties uh, hold significant power um, to influence the governing party, in this case, the Liberals. So for Liberal MPs, I mean, I think the message that you want to send is that they, that they fulfill their election platform commitment that they made in 2019, and that they do that in a really robust way, that they not just legislate a distant target, as we've talked about earlier on, but they also deliver a world-class accountability law, accountability mechanisms that make sure we never again miss these, these important targets. Um, for Bloc and NDP MPs, both of whom uh, have tabled, uh, members of their parties have tabled private members bills in the House of Commons over the last while relating to climate change, in the case of the Bloc relating to climate accountability. Um, I think the message to them is not only to support what the Liberals bring forward, but also to go beyond and push the Liberals to go beyond um, if it's not as far as we'd like it to go based on uh, the kind of framework that Julia laid out. You really uh, ask them to push the Liberals to go beyond and use their power in this minority parliament to make sure we have a very strong Climate Accountability Act. And with Conservative MPs, I mean, I raised earlier that, you know, it's no longer politically feasible to kind of ignore uh, climate or deal with it as a kind of peripheral issue to, to you know, communities, economy, uh, how we're developing socially. So uh, I, that's really, really beginning to sink in these days, I think, um, with Conservative MPs. So, um, you know, the ask there is really that they support this important legislation uh, and to legislate net zero targets by 2050 and the accountability mechanisms to to achieve it. So that's that's kind of engaging directly with your you're a member of parliament. You can also have a look and see if they have any roles on parliamentary committees that are important to this issue 
uh, the one in particular is mentioned down below, the House of Commons Standing Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development. If they are a member of that committee, it's important to be aware of that and, uh, and raise it because they have uh, a little more clout in, in studying the legislation um, as it moves through the parliamentary or the legislative process. Another good option is to send letters to the editor. Uh, we know um, from experience and that uh, members of parliament often look to, or their staff look to local papers to see what's being discussed and who's, uh, who's discussing it uh, as it relates to their, their uh, constituents. And you know, the old adage is that all politics is local. So having um, your voice heard in local papers um, with a clear ask that an expectation that uh, that the government move on climate in the way that we're suggesting is, is another great option. Uh, using social media effectively, I mean, I'm no expert in the world of social media, but where you see stories that deal with the impacts of climate change or uh, maybe stories about what other countries are doing that is progressive on climate change, I mentioned the vision that Joe Biden has put out, uh, it's useful to tag your member of parliament um, maybe retweeting or sharing uh, those types of posts and tagging your, uh, your MP or tagging the Minister of Environment and Climate Change, indicating that you expect um, Canada to come up to snuff to get to the point where we have strong legislation driving us to net zero by 2050. So that's, uh, that's kind of a, a range of things that you can do. When we actually see legislation tabled in the House of Commons, it goes through uh, a, a series of steps that I, I'm not going to unpack now, but the uh, important one that I flagged here is uh, after a bill goes through second reading, it is uh, subject to study by a standing committee of the House of Commons, in this case, the Standing Committee on Environment and Sustainable Development, or NB for short. So once it's tabled, um, that committee will take a few weeks to study the legislation and consider how it may be amended to strengthen it, or in some cases, MPs may argue to amend it to weaken it. Um, the committee process is not one that most are familiar with, many people are familiar with, but it is wide open to any uh, citizen, any person in Canada, to submit a brief and even request to appear before the committee. So we've included a link down there about how you would do that. Um, there are guidelines on how to submit a brief. You could use um, the outline that Julia has presented here in terms of what we think a robust climate accountability act would include to, to write up a brief. And um, seeing those types of submissions come in from, I mean, organizations like ours will do that and we're part of that process. We engage in that process on a regular basis. It's also important that the committee um, see these types of submissions coming in from everyday Canadians, from people that are deeply concerned about climate change like yourselves. Thanks, Tony. Um, I'm just going to put in a plug here for For Our Kids, uh, which is an organization which has chapters across Canada. And For Our Kids now has a campaign on the Climate Accountability Act and people are welcome to go to the webpage dedicated to that and sign up. Um, you'll receive further information about the Climate Accountability Act, um, a script for phoning your MP, and we're also hoping to organize meetings with our MPs over Zoom, obviously, um, and lobby for it in person. Um, just as an anecdote, I was once at a, meet, a seminar on how to lobby and someone asked an MP, how many people does it take for you to pay attention to an issue? And I was expecting it would be like 50. And he said two. So two people showing up to a meeting to an MP, you can make a difference. Um, I'm going to turn now to some of the great questions which are coming in from our audience. So the first question is actually to Julia. This is a question from Tom. And Tom asks, Diane Sachs has recommended the UK Climate Act as a model. Would you agree or and or tell us ideas about how it could be improved upon for Canada? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, our recommendations are largely based on the UK's act. So a lot of what we recommend um, comes from that. 
we amplify the role of uh, impact reports, which was a critique of the uh, UK's Climate Change Act in its 10-year review. As I mentioned, it's been enforced since 2008. So we actually have quite a lot of study um, of that act and its effect to benefit from. And, and we've um, taken full advantage and read up a lot about um, critiques and, and um, positive feedback on the act. So, um, so we've amplified uh, the adaptation piece um, and in the more granular recommendations, we um, specifically note, for example, that there should be an adaptation arm of the expert committee. That was again feedback on the UK Act. Um, uh, and for Canada, I mean, we talk about, I didn't really get into this in the presentation, but sharing the effort across this country is a, is a challenging piece of the puzzle. You know, we have, um, our emissions are, are regional in basis and we have the division of powers between the federal and provincial governments. So we need to figure out a way to talk about that. Um, in our report, we have a very specific recommendation, which is to actually have the experts do the work of carving up a national carbon budget into subnational carbon budgets. Those are informational for the provinces. It's saying to the provinces, um, external experts look at this question of we've got a five-year budget that we can spend as Canada. That means that um, each, you know, you each province gets a chunk of that, adds up to the total. And we think this is fair. And you would come to those numbers, the experts would come to those numbers in consultation with the regions. Then you work together to try and achieve those specifics of national carbon budgets. And where it's not the provincial effort, um, for various reasons, they aren't able to pull or meet those targets through their own policies, the federal government can do a little bit more. That's one way to do it. There's also the approach of using sectoral targets. So making a little bit more industry focused and to break up this big national carbon budget into something smaller that we can then have that conversation about how we share the effort across the country. That will be a piece that Canada has to wrestle with. Um, as I said, our specific recommendation was the subnational approach. It may or may not work um, at this moment in time, um, but so there are some other options as well, and, and we do speak to them in our reports. So those are just uh, two, if not improvements, Canada-specific tweaks to the UK Act, but largely the UK Act has performed very, very well and that's why you see it being really the template for so many other countries. Uh, one last piece is, that, and we, uh, in terms of Indigenous representation, uh, the UK obviously doesn't have the same historical issues with respect to that as we do. So we really took a page from New Zealand on that front and would want that built in heavily throughout the legislation. We noted that we didn't have the opportunity for as much consultation as is absolutely required before legislation like this comes into force. And so that would be another big piece of the puzzle. Thank you, Julia. Um, just a follow-up question. This is from myself. Um, one of the things that I really appreciate about the um, legislative framework that you've proposed is the way in which the reporting um, is so regular and in and of itself will help to raise public awareness of the climate crisis and the need to act on it and what action looks like. Could you speak to how that has been working in the UK? Thanks, that's a great point actually. Um, well, oh, well enough, but it was another area of uh, criticism that more could be done. And um, some open questions as to who would have responsibility for that. Um, the um, recommendations that came out of one 10-year review that I read said, in fact, try and get the expert committee to do more of that. Government's not always great at um, communicating some of their work, and you could make it part of what the expert committee does. Uh, and that's actually in our, our granular recommendations as well. Um, totally key, we talk about public scrutiny and transparency enforceability ultimately legal enforceability is is the big stick but the pressure that the canadian public keeps on the government to actually meet its interim requirements 
when a report starts to show a gap is starting to form here between what you need to achieve and what you're doing, then the public scrutiny piece is much is a much um, is a much finer answer. It's, it can be quick. It can be brought to bear immediately. Whereas building up a case and launching it and having it go its way through the courts is slow. We don't have time. Um, so the the transparency piece is key and definitely communicating to the public so that they have the tools that they need to keep the pressure is really important. Thank you. Yes, um, totally. Building up. Um, Climate literacy is key to building up um, climate solutions. Um, the next question is from Lawrence. Um, he asks, would this legislation be rolled into existing federal accountability organizations like the Parliamentary Budget Office? Mm -hmm. Potentially. Uh, there's a number of different ways in which um, the elements of the five pillars could be delivered. The Parliamentary Budget Office is one, has its system of regular scrutiny um, and you know its expertise around ass assessing spending and so on. Um, and budgeting, there's a nice fit there. There's also the Commissioner of Environment and Sustainable Development, um, which does regular reporting under the auspices of the Auditor, Auditor General. Uh, on sustainable development and, and there's some synergy there too between the roles that are required to be filled under robust climate accountability legislation and that body. So uh, possibly is the answer. It could it could well work. We weren't prescriptive about that in our recommendations. Um, but if the government took the approach of using either the PBO or the CESD, I think it could work quite well. Thank you. Tony, would you like to add anything to that? No, I think Julia's nailed it. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, next question is from Grant. Uh, Grant asks, um, what would happen to Ontario, BC and Quebec's participation in the climate initiative with California, which I think is a cap and trade um, agreement that unfortunately Ontario uh, has already pulled out of. But this question still does apply to the cap and trade agreement with um, California involving BC and Quebec. How would this fit into that? Yeah, the one of the nice things about a climate accountability framework is that it's totally agnostic about the policies that you um, put into place to meet the targets. Uh, they just have to work. They have to actually achieve the budgets. So um, if provinces are taking action, uh, that continues, absolutely. Uh, no problem whatsoever. Um, you would take account of those policy pieces in the planning that you do uh, at the federal level uh, for the carbon budget. So you would say, this is what's happening, this is the cap and trade framework, um, uh, Quebec, California, BC, this is the emissions that are expected to be uh, reduced as a result of that. So you, you account for it in, in your plan. Great, thanks, Julia. Uh, a question now from Amina. Uh, Amina writes, uh, thank you, Julia, for the presentation. Uh, what barriers can we expect on the provincial level with this act? At the federal level, does the UK government have more control over energy than is the case here in Canada? Yes. Uh, yes to um, the second part. And um, I suppose, you would say you would expect to see pushback from the regions um, which have the largest share of GHG emissions because um, the pinch will be felt there. Uh, that being said, there's a real opportunity here for cooperative federalism to work at its very best. Um, while it's so important and we think necessary for the federal government to enact legislation that sets up this predictable framework. It's not to say that it would then preclude the provincial governments from doing their own part um, in their own way. So fitting together, dovetailing their efforts, the BC Climate Accountability Act, for example, would just neatly fit within the federal climate work. 
it's how they are then organizing their provincial, I talked about provincial policy levers, how they're organizing themselves around their policy work to achieve the emissions from within their boundaries. Uh, so I see it as opportunity. I think that it will be challenging, um, but that you can use the advantages that the framework offers. A strong expert advisory committee, which can provide you know, reports on issues that are gonna be relevant to the specific provinces and territories. Um, a coordinated approach, uh, centralized information and reporting, all of that uh, to work together as a country rather than, and then, rather than just uh, look at it as a negative or something that is being forced upon provinces. Yeah, can I just follow up on that a little bit? And because I, I mean, Julia went went where I was going to go with the this uh, opportunity framing, and and you know we we often, including ourselves, talk about uh, the challenges around effort sharing, if you will, or sharing responsibility across our federation, and you know different economies are uh, comprised differently uh, across the country. But I think when you when you look at the broader picture of where the world is going and ultimately where we're going and and it seems to be where our large neighbor to the south may be going is you know seeing increasing perspective around uh, climate risk in 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 the finance sector, seeing shifting um, investment portfolios, uh, you're seeing a real push on not just renewable energy but other clean technologies, whether that's in the vehicle sector or others. Uh, you know, low carbon cement, all these kind of the world is heading in a different direction. So, you know, to me, it will remain a challenge. I don't want to, I don't want to um, overlook that. But um, given the, 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 the direction the world is going, it also needs to be looked upon as an opportunity and that this, again, you know, uh, type of legislation, a framework legislation that is non-prescriptive on the how, um, it's just that we do hit our targets and that they are legislated and there is accountability um, throughout the system of government for, for nailing them is the important piece. The how may be seen as a significant opportunity for many industries if, if they look at it in that light and should be seen that way by provinces as well, I think. And just one more point to make, um, you know, several decades ago, we had a real fight about um, universal health care in this country. Um, provinces did not necessarily want to buy into a system, a centralized system, um, and the Canada Health Act imposes certain requirements, portability, accessibility, so on. Um, that was challenged at the time by the provinces. Was, there's was back and forth. Uh, doctors didn't like it. But now, um, many people would point to our robust public health care as a key ingredient, if not the key ingredient, in our ability to respond to the crisis that is COVID um, and to come out of it far better off than our neighbors to the south. So, you know, that I think is a strong, strong analogy for why you have to push through. There are going to be difficult moments, of course, um, but hopefully that brings us out in a strong position to, to be responding to the climate emergency. Thanks, Julia. That actually ties very well to our last question, which is from Hannah. Hannah asks, uh, what kind of arguments can we expect to see in Parliament against enacting this kind of net zero accountability act? Mm. Um, that's a good question. And, and uh, I mean, it's crystal ball gazing because it, re it remains to be seen. I think um, certainly what we've been talking about here, the implications for uh, provinces and territories will be something that is raised. Um, I think, you know, there'll be, there'll be important questions. There'll be questions about what this means for sectors, sorry, for provinces or regions of the country that are, whose economies are still significantly dependent on, on fossil fuel production or, or other heavy um, carbon emitting um, sectors. Uh, on the other hand, as we've been saying here, you know, given where things are heading, I think, I think, and the fact that we have, uh, as I said earlier, a majority of parties and a majority of MPs affiliated with those parties that have proposed strong uh, or ran on strong climate action and climate 
uh, direction, including accountability legislation like we've been talking about here, um, bodes well for um, for the legislation to, to make it through Parliament. The trick is really about how long this minority Parliament lasts and um, that the real hope, and again, maybe this is a message to send for folks that are reaching out to their elected officials, that it's really vitally important that this legislation be passed through the House of Commons and through the Senate before we find ourselves in the next election, which is always a question mark as to when that will be under, under a minority parliament. Thank you, Tony, uh, which reminds me of one other strength of this act is that it can endure beyond changes in government, which is so important. So Absolutely. encouraging encouraging everyone to get out there and um, talk to their MPs, email, call. So I will now hand it back to Carolyn. Thank you for a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to the three of you. Uh, I found this incredibly informative, um, really interesting, and I, I think uh, it's fair to say that others did as well. Um, and while we need to wrap things up here today, this is certainly not the end of this conversation. It will be continuing, especially as this political process unfolds. Um, and I want to thank everyone who joined us today for logging on to this call. I thought you might be interested to know that there were more than 180 people. So we are a group of committed and, and caring folks. And it's really great to know that you're engaged on these issues and that you stand with EcoJustice and with excuse me, with For Our Kids and Climate Fast and all the many organizations doing work um, uh, around this. And as you heard today, we're definitely going to need all of your voices to keep the pressure on our elected officials and ensure they put us on the path to a safer, more resilient future. Um, you'll be getting uh, updates from EcoJustice, uh, especially at critical moments when we can really, uh, that we can really leverage to put the pressure on. So please stay tuned. Uh, if you want to share this conversation with a friend or uh, if you missed maybe the beginning of it, we'll be sharing a link to a video recording. Um, we'll also include a link to the slides, so keep your eye out for that. And yeah, I just want to emphasize again that EcoJustice is going to keep delivering on our mission to use the full force of the law to defend nature, combat the climate emergency, and fight for your right to a healthy environment. Uh, so thank you again, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Have a wonderful uh, day and evening. Please stay safe and please take care of one another. So thank you. See you next time.